generations, people have looked up to the skies and marveled at the northern lights. We uncover the science behind them and how the gorgeous glow can influence more than our night skies. This is the Northern Lights Revealed. The Northern Lights, we've heard about them all our lives, we've seen photos, and now many of us have seen them with our own eyes. But most of us still have no idea what they are or how they happen. And even when we hear the explanation, it's still a mystery. Solar flares send radiation that's deflected by the Earth's magnetic shield. What? I'm King 5 Chief Meteorologist Mike Everett. With the possibility of seeing more solar storms coming up, we're explaining in basic terms what's actually happening and answering some of the questions you may have. Let's start with the sun. Now, it appears circular because it's over 93 million miles away, but it's actually a bubbling, boiling mass of hydrogen and helium with no solid surface. Certain portions of the sun belch and burp, much like volcanic eruptions. Sometimes particular openings belch and burp solar flares that contain electromagnetic pulses straight at us. These electromagnetic pulses race across that 93 million mile span and attempt to rip away our atmosphere. You know, the thing that keeps us breathing, hydrated, and burns up most asteroids. And and they'd succeed too if it wasn't for the miracle that is the Earth's magnetic field. Without the magnetic field, life on Earth as we know it would not be possible as it shields us from the constant bombardment by charged particles emitted from the sun. These charged particles are called the solar wind. Earth's magnetic field is generated on our planet's interior and extends out into space. Wait, the entire planet is one giant magnet? Yeah, you may imagine that we just have a giant magnet at the core of the Earth, but it's more complicated and way cooler than that. Molten lava beneath the Earth's surface is comprised mostly of iron. So as we're spinning, the iron that's being agitated creates friction, and that generates electromagnetic energy that radiates out into space. So putting it all into motion, the sun shoots the equivalent of solar laser beams at us, and we deflect most of that energy around, away, and back out into space. So what are all the lights about? Well, what we're watching is the battle taking place. Auroras occur when charged particles from solar flares attack Earth's magnetic field and collide with gases in Earth's upper atmosphere. The particles that make up the solar wind are deflected by Earth's magnetic field, so they mostly pass around the Earth without crashing into us. But it's not a perfect shield. Because of the shape of Earth's magnetic field close to the North and South Poles, a little bit of the solar wind can sometimes get through and crash directly into Earth's atmosphere. That's why they're typically only viewable at far southern and northern latitudes, thus the name Northern Lights. This crash happens between very tiny particles. It speeds much faster than a bullet, so the result is different from something like a car crash. Instead of throwing off smaller pieces or exploding, they emit light. The colors tell us about what type of atmospheric particle is being crashed into by the solar wind. Red and green are oxygen collisions, and blue is from nitrogen. So should we be scared? <laughs> no, it's not dangerous to us directly because we're protected from these fast-moving particles by Earth's atmosphere. But astronauts who are above the atmosphere may have to take shelter in a heavily shielded part of the space station, and satellites can be temporarily shut down or, in some cases, even broken. On very rare occasions, the auroras caused by a solar storm can be so powerful that electrical lines on Earth can be damaged, causing many people to lose power. Because we have telescopes in space and on Earth that carefully watch the sun for these storms, we usually have two to three days of warning before a storm hits the Earth. Now we head to King 5 senior meteorologist Rich Marriott, who will dive into our most recent historic aurora event. Everybody knows the May 11th aurora was a big event, but how big was it? It's estimated that it was one of the top 20 events in the past 500 years. This timeline shows when those storms took place. The bigger the dot, the farther south people could see the aurora. Why was the May 11th event so powerful? Not surprisingly, a lot of things had to come together. And in order to explain it, we have to look at the cause of it, the sun. The sun is a star. It's made up of super hot electrified gases that are bound together by strong magnetic fields. The magnetic fields and the plasma perform a complex dance that we see at the surface of the sun, looping and stretching, looking a little like a pot of fast boiling water. The most active areas are usually associated with groups of dark sunspots. The magnetic field lines can stretch out too far and break, snapping a little like a rubber band. 
When the magnetic lines snap, they can launch huge bubbles of plasma and magnetic fields out into space. This is what solar scientists call a coronal mass ejection, or CME. The snap is usually accompanied by brilliant flashes of high energy light called solar flares. If the CMEs are launched in the right direction from the sun, they can hit the Earth's magnetic field and cause a geomagnetic storm. The amount of magnetic turmoil on the sun follows an 11 year cycle. During what scientists call solar minimum, there are very few sunspots and the sun's magnetic field is quiet with very little twisting and turning. But during solar maximum, there could be frequent and large sunspots. During this time, the sun's magnetic field can churn constantly, shooting out frequent CMEs. And now we have all the elements we need for the monster geomagnetic storm that struck the Earth on May 11th. First, we're approaching a solar maximum right now. The sun has been very active this year with frequent CMEs. Fortunately, most are not aimed at the Earth. But during the week preceding May 11th, a giant sunspot group wider than almost 16 Earths formed and began producing solar flares and CMEs. Beginning on May 7th, the giant sunspot group spit out four CMEs in quick succession. The sunspots were in just the right place on the sun to send those CMEs in the Earth's direction. However, CMEs can be launched at different speeds, ranging anywhere from 60,000 miles per hour to over 6 million miles per hour. In this case, the fourth CME was the fastest and quickly overtook the other three. This combined all of their plasma and magnetic fields into a giant CME, or what is sometimes called a cannibal CME. This is what blasted the Earth's magnetic field on May 11th for the extreme geomagnetic storms and the incredible display of northern lights. At least three more slower CMEs blasted out of the sun that week, and they maintained the auroras at a much lower level for another two or three days, but not like what we saw on May 11th. When geomagnetic storms are this intense, they can impact many aspects of technology, anywhere from GPS to power grids. I took a closer look at what's at stake and what scientists are doing to prepare for big storms in the future. The May 11th geomagnetic storms were the strongest since 2003. Since that time, our reliance on electronics and satellites has grown massively, and our vulnerability to strong storms has grown as well. Unfortunately, it's energy that's not supposed to be there, and uh, you know, we can't really harness it, um, and it causes problems. The largest geomagnetic storm ever observed by humans occurred on September 30th, 1859. It was called the Carrington event and it was also the first time a solar flare was observed. In 1859, the only tech around was the simple telegraph, but the entire telegraph system was disrupted by the storm. Telegraph operators were running without uh, using their batteries and in some cases some equipment caught fire. So that was the first real heads up that, hey, you know, if you build long conductors and superimpose a geomagnetic storm over them, you're going to have some, some excitement. Today, geomagnetic storms can overload power grids, burning out wires, transformers, and other equipment. This has happened recently. The most notable event was a strong storm in March of 1989, which caused a blackout in Quebec, Canada. Six million people lost power, some for as long as nine hours. But this is only the tip of the iceberg in our wired society. GPS signals pass through the Earth's own layer of charged particles, the ionosphere. This layer can be disrupted by a geomagnetic storm affecting GPS accuracy. During the May 11th storm, some farmers reported seed planting to be off by several meters, and one farmer reported his tractor was driving in circles, all guided by GPS. They rely on GPS and ground-based augmentation systems to help them steer the tractors. And uh, unfortunately, when we had that big geomagnetic storm, that will disturb the ionosphere so much that GPS uh, can malfunction and then your tractor is going where it's not supposed to be. Increased radiation from the storms poses safety problems for airplanes, especially on polar routes. And the astronauts on the ISS were advised to avoid less shielded areas of the space station during the storm. And sometimes the increased radiation can damage the electronics on satellites. These storms also heat up the Earth's atmosphere, causing it to expand. This causes more drag on satellites and shortens their time in orbit. The Hubble Space Telescope ordinarily loses about 40 meters of altitude per day due to drag. This jumped to 80 meters per day during the storm. Pigeons get lost during geomagnetic storms. And pigeon racing turns out to be like a billion dollar industry because they bet on them like racehorses. And uh, I had no idea. Although the May 11th geomagnetic storm was historic, it's estimated that the Carrington event in 1859 might have been two to four times stronger and could cause trillions of dollars in damage today. There's still a lot of work to be done to protect our electronic infrastructure. 
May 11th was not only the first time that many people saw the Northern Lights, but it was also the first time that they'd heard of the Space Weather Forecast or the Space Weather Prediction Center. Over the last 50 years, Aurora forecasting has come a long way. Rich shows us how it's changed and what's next on the horizon. The Space Weather Prediction Center actually went online in the mid-2000s. This was when we realized how much space weather impacts the technology we use every day. NOAA runs it along with eight other environmental prediction centers. Space weather was largely unknown before the space age. The Earth's atmosphere does such a good job of protecting us that we were mostly unaware of what was happening in the space around us. But as soon as the satellites started flying in the late 1950s, discoveries began. The earliest satellites discovered unknown belts of high energy radiation surrounding the Earth and Mariner 2 confirmed the existence of the solar wind for the first time in 1962. Once we decided we were going to put people up there, it became important to know a lot more about that environment. As late as the mid-1990s, we had no satellites that continuously monitored the sun from above the atmosphere. This seriously hampered our ability to forecast solar storms. It would be like trying to understand our earthly weather by occasionally taking measurements inside your house. Finally, around the turn of the century, many new spacecraft were launched to observe the sun continuously and from many angles. These led to the discovery of coronal mass ejections, or CMEs, that can trigger geomagnetic storms. Currently, there are about 19 sun-observing spacecraft. Some are even parked between the Earth and sun to give us an early warning about approaching solar storms. One of the greatest things has been uh, the development of what's called a coronagraph. Um, so you can think of it, again, like a, like a revolution with the radar with the introduction of Doppler because in the early days we couldn't see those coronal mass ejections come off the sun um, or at least not very well. Right now we can forecast geomagnetic storms about one to four days before they reach the earth but sometimes we have trouble determining how hard they'll hit the earth's atmosphere. This makes it difficult to judge how strong the storms will be. We can't track it until it hits uh, a satellite that's about a million miles from Earth at the L1 Lagrange point. And when it hits that, we get our first look at the magnetic field in its orientation, you know, and, 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 then, and then it's just unfolding as it passes. So, but we can see at least how, you know, the magnitude, how far south it goes, because that's the, that's the component that matters. Today, space probes are flying closer to the sun, gathering ever more precise information. The Parker Solar Probe has flown through the sun's two million degree atmosphere of the corona and in 2023 it was blasted by a CME and survived. These observations combined with others are finally helping us build computer models. These will allow us to forecast and prepare for space weather events just like we do for storms down on the surface of the Earth. Forecasting is getting better, but we still can't tell more than a couple days out if we're going to be able to see the Aurora. You can check the Aurora forecast yourself on the Space Weather Prediction Center website. These maps show you which areas are likely to see the Aurora. Your best chances are in the areas above the red view line. The more red shading you see on the map, the stronger the Aurora chances are. You'll also hear a lot about how scientists measure the strength and intensity of solar storms. The two most common are the KP index and the G scale. The KP index ranges from 0 to 9, representing geomagnetic activity on an increasing scale. Now, when it reaches KP5, activity has reached storm level. It's also measured using the geomagnetic G scale from G1 to G5. It sounds complicated, but when the KP index is 5 and the G scale is 1, you can expect to see the northern lights as far south as Seattle or Toronto and possibly experience weak electrical fluctuations in the electrical grid, minor satellite disruptions, and possibly some migrating animals. When the KP index is 9 and the G scale is 5, you can expect to see the northern lights as far south as Texas and northern Mexico and experience major impacts to the electrical grid. High frequency radio communications and satellite communications could be cut off as well. Now, of course, the weather also has to cooperate, so be sure to check the weather forecast to see if there'll be clear skies. And if the forecast is good, you may want to capture photos of the northern lights. We spoke with a Seattle photographer who gave us some tips. When the Northern Lights make an appearance... No, I've never seen anything like this ever. The whole town comes out to witness them. Just to kind of stop and take in that moment. Yeah, it was, it was a little, getting a little choked up thinking about it now. If you've seen the Northern Lights, you may have wondered, why do they look so much brighter in pictures than they do in person? Because of light pollution, they may not be green, they may be white. Your cameras have sensors that gets that, that noise pollution down to a minimum and turns them back to green. 
Seattle photographer Tim Durkin has been chasing the Northern Lights for years. He says they may appear more colorful on camera because your eyes don't capture light the same way as your camera lens. Sometimes they're red, depending upon whether or not that, uh, those electrically charged particles are interacting with the nitrogen in the atmosphere or the oxygen. So they can turn emerald green, they can be nice dark red. When you're trying to capture a stunning shot of the aurora, Tim offers these tips. You can get a picture on, on a modern cell phone. You'll need a tripod or need to set the camera up somewhere where you, it's nice and stable. And if you've got a DSLR camera. Get a tripod, number one. Shutter release button, number two. The less shake you have in the camera, the more clear whatever you have in the, in the foreground is, is gonna be sharp and in focus. If your camera has the ability, Tim says a time lapse is the way to go. You set your exposure to about once every two seconds. Do it over the you know, 15, 20 minute period at the height. As soon as you see the first pillar occurring, hit the go button on that time lapse and it'll blow your mind. And wherever you are, make sure it's really dark. The further north you go, the further out of the city lights into nature, the better chance you are, are going to see the northern lights. Once you're there, sit back and enjoy the show. It's also a moment to just kind of uh, commune with nature. You're, you're about to see something that uh, you can imagine what they thought of 100, 500, 1,000 years ago when they looked up to the skies and saw this event going on. It still is just one of the most amazing sights you can really see. Scientists are expecting many more solar storms as we near the 11 year maximum and their impacts could extend well into 2025 and possibly 2026. So if you missed the last event, you probably have more chances to see this spectacle and I highly recommend it. Thanks for joining us and happy Aurora hunting.